How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, and it is Wednesday here on the show, and you know what that means? We got a lot to talk about here today, not the least of which is some big business. AW Big Business is tonight, and Tony Khan has stated... That he will not let us down. So we'll tell you about the lineup for the show. What's coming. What may be coming. And plenty more. AW Big Business tonight. TD Gardens in Boston. And of course the expected debut of Mercedes Monet. We have a bunch of other news as well. Including Thunderbolt Patterson. The newest member of the WWE Hall of Fame. We got the raw ratings from Monday night as we build towards WrestleMania, which is coming up in just a few weeks. Will Ospreay talked on Chris Jericho's podcast about going to AEW, so that AEW offered him a much better deal than WWE. Britt Baker is doing media. I guess we'll see what that means. But uh, she did some media talking about wanting to be back wrestling, doing promos, etc. And we have got, as always... Notes from the NXT show last night, which if you miss the show, I cannot in good conscience tell you to go watch the show, but, but, you should watch the last 10 minutes of this show with this Trick Williams promo, this Trick Williams promo and post-match, this guy is unbelievable. And uh, just an incredible segment. So we'll tell you about that and uh, and any other notes from the show. If you want to text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. F4W online at gmail.com. I'm also F4W online on threads, Instagram, Cameo, at Brian Alvarez on X. Back in a moment with Mike Semper, BB, and more Observer Live. We've almost reached the pinnacle of the tour, but this is one of the most important things. This is the computer. This is the workstation where I do the majority of the actual physical part of putting Figure 4 together. I do the writing here, the editing here, of course the phone calls, um, even the uh, microphone here when we used to do Wrestling Observer Live, which has since died. And uh, in fact, I better put the uh, screensaver on here so this doesn't get burned in the screen. But Putting the newsletter together, people understand, is it's a lot of hard work and dedication, like two to three hours per week sometimes I have to spend on it. And, um, hold on a second. Figure four, who's this? Carl Thrillo? Yeah. yeah hey, 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 listen, can I, can I call you back? I'm, I'm doing something here right now. My fridge? Yes, running. Hello? Anyway, um, this is, uh, like I said, computer, got the TV here, this is pretty much the place. This is going to be a quick tour of the trophy room. This is actually my trophy case, it's made of mahogany, very expensive. But what is worth far more than the case itself is what is inside, and that is the medals from the various sports and the accomplishments that I've achieved during my lifetime. This first drawer here is my gymnastics medal. Here, I got uh, state and such. These are my Taekwondo medals. These down here, amateur wrestling medals. And down here are the 26 medals that I won in the five kilometer walk down to the Boston Landing over the course of the past five years. And, um, you know, I realize that uh, I'm a four sports superstar right here. And some people, you know, it might, uh, might bother them that they haven't had such achievements in their life. But I think that the whole point is that you can achieve anything. You know, if you can make a great pie, you can win the pie eating contest at the uh, Puyallup Fair. And, uh, I don't know. Hell, if you can eat a good pie, you might win the pie eating contest as well. So there's there's achievement in this life for everybody.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Tony Khan does not plan on disappointing fans tonight. The AW president spoke to TV Insider ahead of AW Big Business at Boston's TD Garden with rumors that Mercedes Monet could debut on the show. Khan was asked if fans can expect any new talent to show up tonight. He responded, of course. I promise I will not disappoint the fans tonight. There has been an influx of huge names, and tonight is the biggest show yet. Tonight? Tonight. When we launched AEW, I listen, I, I don't want to get people mad at me, but I I don't know. When we launched AEW, it was the first time in many years. So many resources and such a strong roster of wrestlers have come together to form a new challenger promotion. After five years, AEW is now stronger than ever before. Our roster continues to get deeper and better. This has become a popular destination that top stars seek out. Perfect time to continue expanding and growing. It's what tonight is all about. AEW Big Business. With such a strong group of wrestlers in AEW today, we've come so far from the beginning in 2019. Now we have what I believe is the best roster in pro wrestling today. Well, that's certainly arguable, let me tell you. Still so many great stars out there. We're always looking to add and strengthen the group. I think we will continue to try and strengthen whenever we can add someone's skills to make AEW better. I think the constant innovation, perpetual strides, always wanting to get better are a big part of the spirit of AEW. Tony Khan was asked about Kevin Kelly as well. Kevin Kelly was removed from the AEW roster page. Did not work collision. PW Torch reported he has been fired. And Tony Khan said, I prefer not to comment on that, but I appreciate you asking. That's certainly a comment I wish he'd used a lot in the past, but he did not. Was there any follow-up? No, there was not. He said, I cannot comment on that. So, I appreciate you asking. He addressed the criticism of Darby Allen's glass-shattering spot. He says it has to be something safe. Whenever a wrestler comes in and wants to try something what? especially dangerous, I just want to know that there's a safe way to do it. <laughs> Darby Allen, every time that he's ever had an idea for a wild high spot, uh, high spot or crazy move. And then he can stay at the luxury budget inn. He's had a rationale and plan. Darby doesn't take these things lightly. I'm sorry, but, you know, there's really not not a safe way to fall off a 15-foot ladder and added four (laughs) feet for the ring apron through glass to the floor. No. I mean, he didn't die. He only got 12 stitches. But I could not in good conscience ever state that that was safe, what he did. Well, you know, you're right about that, but we are in the stuntman era now, aren't we? And there are... I At least I can see for... Whatever you want to say about the precautions that they took, at least they probably took a lot more than some of their brothers and sisters on the indie scene uh, take doing things that are on par with that. So I I guess I'll try to give them credit that way. (laughs) We have got the lineup for the show tonight. It is Samoa Joe versus Wardlow for the AW World title. We have Darby Allen versus Jay White. We have Okada, Matt, and Nick Jackson versus Eddie Kingston, Pac, and Penta. Hook and Chris Jericho versus the Gates of Agony. And Willow Nightingale versus Riho. That's the lineup for the show. Mercedes Monet is expected to debut. Now, the other two things I'm going to say here, I'm telling you with all sincerity, I have absolutely no earthly idea. Okay? But, I don't know why. I honestly do not know why. But I see Samoa Joe versus Wardlow. Mm-hmm. And like, why do I expect MGF is returning tonight? I know. Feels that way, doesn't it? Yes. And then also, why do I feel like Britt Baker is returning tonight? Because she's doing media all of a sudden. She is. She is. Well, that's probably why. She uh, did a bunch of media. So she can't wait to return. Uh, she hasn't wrestled since September. Took part in a panel discussion, SXSW, on Monday. She was asked South by Southwest. if she feels the best is yet to come for her uh, career. She said, yes, I do. Growing as a wrestler, performer, and learning what works and what doesn't work. 
with all the new talents coming in, new talent we have to work with, new coaches, new people coming over from WWE, new brains and minds you get to pick, you're really doing yourself a huge disservice if you're not constantly asking everybody around you for help. I think the help in AEW is growing and growing for me personally. Can't wait to get back in the ring, have one of these microphones in my hand, cut some promos. I don't know, she says, just stay tuned. Hmm. And I don't know either, but I am staying tuned. But uh, she's, throw... I believe she's good to go. So we'll find out. Let me throw something by you here. Even though I have lobbied for Tony Storm and Mercedes de Monet to jump in right off the bat to try to make something out of this Tony Storm thing, and it may have not make sense. But considering that, you know, Britt has been on social media in the past couple of months, wondering why she was not on the shows and such. And obviously she was recovering from a back injury and all that sort of stuff. Maybe if you're going in a different direction with Tony Storm, Mercedes Monet and Britt Baker upset that she has been there since day one. You know, she is one of the people, she should be a pillar in her own right in AEW, but she keeps getting passed over. You think you can work this into a storyline that way and make it work? Because on paper, and, and granted, look, I'm not a big as big of a fan in, as Britt in the ring as you are, and I think she's behind some other people that are there. But with that said... I think Mercedes Monet and Britt Baker on paper is a really great matchup. Well, of course it is. AEW can easily promote. Well, I guess we'll find out tonight because it is big business. And uh, you will not be let down, or Tony will give you your money back. I'm not expecting to be let down by the show tonight. I'll tell you that much. I don't know if anybody was, but I think uh, I, I am wondering why. There's no hole for Mercedes to punch through here, like a Tony Storm segment. Why didn't they announce her for crying out loud? Well, even give us something that may lead to her being there. Like, what's she going to interfere in the Darby Allen J. White match? Like, there's no even, like, goofy, even though I know AEW fans hate some WWE things, sometimes it's very easy to just set up something so you know somebody's got to come crash this party. And they actually have not done that. Hey, you Unless know what I do? Willow and Riho are going to be the I'll thing. tell you what I'd do. What's that? I'll tell you what I'd do tonight. And it doesn't have to be Brit. It can be anybody. But it should be. It should be Brit because she's a big star. She's been going a long time. But, you know, top of the hour or whatever, end of the show, whenever you're going to do it, you do whatever you're going to do, and then the lights go out. And, of course, everybody freaks out because they think, my God, Mercedes is here. But then the music hits, and it's the return of Britt Baker. and Or whoever, whoever you use. Stokely Hathaway. And uh, as long as it's a return, I think it's going to get a big pop. If it's just like, you know, someone they see every week, that person will be booed out of the building if they're a baby face. But, you know, you get that person down to the ring, and then the lights go out again, and then here comes Mercedes, and they have the big stare down. Yeah, as for said Jamie Hayter, whoever. And, uh... And listen, also here, uh, this person says, I also think the show starts and Mercedes music immediately hits. Let me tell you something. Bro, we just saw the last two weeks of SmackDown numbers, okay? It's abundantly clear. If you've got something big, in the case of WWE, The Rock, if you save that until the end of the show, you will do a significantly better viewership than if you open the show with it, get the big first part of the show, and then everybody turns the show off. Like everyone didn't like everybody didn't turn the show off, but the Rush, the SmackDown show this week was much higher than it was the week prior because they saved the Rock till the end of the show, as opposed to the week earlier where they did the first forty minutes of the show and then they lost a bunch of the people that tuned in to see the Rock. So no, I absolutely, positively, unequivocally would not put her in the opening segment of this show. Save her for the end. No, Make and, people wait and watch the show and then give it to them. And have some sort of tease between going between the 8.45 to 9 o'clock segments. Make sure you do something there because people are going to be tuning in. Has she debuted yet? Go ahead. Try to do something there that creates some interest and has them at least coming back throughout until the end of the show. Listen, I know Punk debuted at the beginning of the show. Okay? That was, that was years ago. We have evidence from two weeks ago that debuting at the end of the show, saving the big star for the end of the show, is going to do better than the beginning. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
you know, that was a very special night for me. Um, and I've listened to Cody about it. It's not one of his, it's not his top match, he says, but man, it's mine. You know what I mean? It's uh, very special in my heart. And to do that at 50, right, is a, uh, it's just a, it's a great achievement for somebody like me, man. It really is to be in my kind of my, st my shape still in good shape to be able to go out there with the young, young kids and pull things off. Um, it's, it's so amazing. You know, when I was so nervous when we, you know, Cody's music hit and he broke the throne with a sledgehammer and all that, I'm just waiting for my, my entrance. Right. And this new, upstart company AEW I didn't know how the fans would respond to me uh whether they would boo me or whether they would you know cheer me or whatever so I'm so nervous and I'm so laser focused on what I'm doing but it, it was like god my butterflies in my stomach were crazy my music hit and they responded in kind and I was like okay it's not so bad and I'm always like that as soon as I go through the tunnel it goes away Right. And then I'm laser focused on what I need to do, man. And it's like it was good to feel that reaction from the, a new fan base that had watched me my whole career. But they're different than WWE fans to go down there. And, you know, um, I've explained this before and it's let's see if you can understand it. I step in the ring. Right. And they start chanting Dusty's name. Right. Which really just. Oh man, you know, chills on your on your body. You're in the moment. You're so laser focused, and you hear that for a moment because I point to the to the sky. I point up, and they started to chant "Dusty," and then all of a sudden, the sound and everybody in the arena has become blurry to me. Right? I can hear them, but I can't hear them. I can see them, but I can't. I'm so focused on Cody and what we need to do right now to get it to where it is. Because for years and years, I was told, no, it wasn't good enough to be on WrestleMania or whatever. So we had a thing to prove here and I was focused about it. And we probably could have done a couple things wrong in that match and it still wouldn't have mattered. It was so good. The story was built in one promo a piece. They were ready for it. All the stars aligned, the magic happens. And we struck lightning and it was really cool to do. And I think that match will go down in history as, as, you know, one of the greatest matches of all time. You know, there's some great matches out there, but I think it really, it, it holds water. I think it, it's going to be talked about for 10 years from now, you know, 15, 20 years from now. Well, we'll see where the walk-up is tonight, but uh, the show as of this morning, 77-79. Last time they were in the building was for Blood and Guts, where they did uh, 89.56. So uh, about 1,000 tickets below that. But uh, we'll see how they do tonight. I think they should have advertised her. I, I don't I see think any reason he, why they did not. I just think as it got closer... Because, again, I was a little skeptical at the beginning when they booked the building of that size, even scaling it, that, okay, what is Sasha just alone going to be worth? What is going back into the market going to be worth? Because we know when they've returned to markets here recently, there's been a, a big, pretty good decline. So what was she going to be worth on top of that? And, and we, we kind of now know what it is, but maybe they could have done more as – the weeks were leading up where, okay, we kind of know what the, where we're at right now. And in the last three weeks, add some little hints, add something to try to whip people into a little bit of a frenzy here. And yes, I know for AEW fans, they all know she's going to be there. But with that said, it creates some social media nonsense because look, everybody loves that. And some clues on IG, some things on Twitter, things like that for people who, have kind of lapsed from AEW and all they are paying attention to right now is WWE because WWE is just saturating everything. 
So people says, are people that dense to not know she's coming tonight? That's <laughs> Well, I mean, the point is we will never know because we don't know the difference. If there was an alternate universe where they advertise her in advance and then this universe, we would know. But that universe does not exist. So, yes, I'm sure there are plenty of people. I mean, dude, there's all sorts of stuff that I don't find out until last second. And this is my job. But, you know, this is not like CM Punk. I said this yesterday. If you watch what they do with CM Punk... Like it wasn't it wasn't a secret at all. I mean, they used his catchphrases. I mean, this is what have they done? What it have they done? CM Punk in Chicago. There's they, the intangible they put, of they that. They put dollar signs <laughs> on the word Boston. What else did they do? Exactly. The one one that, person guess... on on collision in a promo backstage on a on a show that maybe half of the dynamite audience watches said boss. That's where we're at. Yeah. Okay. This this is not like they were dropping hints left and right, and it's an open secret. Like you know, if you know, if you don't know, you don't know. And I know that sounds stupid, but it's it, that's what it is. Like if you're not just intensely involved in all of this, if you're just a person who watches wrestling on TV, you don't have any idea. If you're in the area and you just watch Dynamite and Collision and Rampage, and you're not living and dying on the internet, you don't know. That's it. And it's fine. That's what they decided to do. You know who's going to know tomorrow? Everybody. Because she's going to debut. So there you go. As far as other news, Danielson also talked about his belts. In fact, he doesn't win any. He was asked uh, about transferring stardom from one generation to another. He says, the idea is to pass on what stardom I have been given. Pass it on to the younger wrestlers. I've had some people ask me or say things to me like, Brian, you should be champion. You should have been champion. You should have this or you should have that. The reality is to me, no, the champions we've had have been great. Hangman was a great champion. MGF was a great champion. Elevated these younger people to now these people are stars. Put Hangman on TV now, he draws a rating. Put MGF on TV, draws a rating. It would be easy to take stars of the past, make them your champion, make them your top guy. That's the easy way. It's much harder to take somebody like MGF, who hadn't been on national television, turn him into a star that draws ratings. That was my bigger goal. To transfer stardom from one generation to the other. He's not answering the question why he can't win a title. He's he's concentrating on the main AEW title. But why hasn't he won the international title? And then put somebody over for the title to make them a bigger star. Why didn't he win the uh, the crown, the continental crown? Put somebody over to make him a star. You make someone a bigger star when it's a bigger deal that they beat you. When you go in there and everybody beats you, remember when Drew Gulak beat Brian Danielson? Yeah. What did that lead to? And don't even tell me Brian Danielson wasn't a big star at the time. Daniel Bryan was a huge star. What did it mean to just get a win over Brian Danielson? This it, we're at the point now where you face Brian Danielson, you're probably getting a win. Okay. Like what we need is Brian Danielson to win a title. To be pushed as a champion. And then he puts somebody over. That's going to get them over bigger than just everybody beating Brian Danielson in his last year. I don't know. I'm looking at a cage match right now, and it's like, okay, yeah, he put over MJF, the 60-minute world title Iron Man match. But he beat Sammy Guevara. Okay, he put over John Moxley. Did it make John Moxley any bigger of a star? No. He had the feud with Ricky Starks. That was all good stuff. Starks never got a win, and yeah, we wanted to see more Ricky Starks, but I think that has to do with wanting to see more Ricky Starks, you know, than it did with Danielson. Christian Cage, well, he beat Danielson, you know, for a TNT title defense, so, okay, he put over Eddie Kingston. Let's be honest now. I love that their interaction was great, the Claudio stuff in there with Eddie, all that old school stuff that played into this storyline. I'm old, so I, I dug a lot what was going on, but like at the end of the day, is Eddie Kingston in any better position than he was before? It, certainly not than he was a year or two ago. So I, I understand what he's saying, but people aren't getting over more, and and things aren't any better than they were. Is Wheeler Yuta? And again, he's got he's established a character for himself in the Blackpool Combat Club. But it's like, okay, you know, I thought he wanted to do stuff with Lee Moriarty. Remember that there were these young guys. It was Wheeler Yuta, Daniel Garcia, and 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 Lee Moriarty. 
coming in kind of all at the same time, all guys that Brian Daniels should, should, should salivate over wanting to help and doing something with. He hasn't done it with those guys. So I dig what he's saying, but like you can win a title and lose it to somebody who could actually use it a lot more than some of the people that you have put over. We've got Thunderbolt Patterson hmm. announced for the WWE Hall of Fame. You know, there's a lot of people in WCW that probably would vote him into the Hall of Fame. He joins Paul Heyman, Bull Nakano, Muhammad Ali, U.S. Express. He was an advocate for equal pay and better rights for wrestlers. Black wrestler who was blacklisted from the most well-known promotion in the 70s in part due to deeply ingrained racism in the business will be inducted into the WWE's Hall of Fame next month. I was the originator of the shuck and jive style, he told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. In 1999, worked several NWA territories. After getting a start in Texas under Dory Funk, formed a team with Jerry Briscoe, won the NWA Atlantic Coast titles in 1973, beat the Sheik, brass, NWA Brass Knuckles title. Patterson significantly stalled after a decade in the business. His career by the 70s, his bookings began to drop due to his uh, unflinching attitude towards his humanity and his working conditions advocated for a more equal pay system. You're laughing over there. So I love this. I love Bolt, but, you know, here's the thing. Well, here's let me get to the point. Very complex. Go ahead. He was part of a racial discrimination lawsuit against WCW that was eventually settled out of court. And uh, I forget I forget which wrestler uh, said Our body? it. Oh. Well, one of them mentioned that they they made out like bandits. <laughs> well, that was the exact one. <laughs> that was the exact terminology. Yes. Made out like bandits. And they, you know what? Good. If there were ever reparations given to African American professional wrestlers, that was as close as you were ever going to get for a lot of the hell that they went through. And let me tell you something. Thunderbolt Patterson went through a lot of hell. The reason that I giggle a little bit is, look, it is good to put a shine on. Uh, what Thunderbolt Patterson did, absolutely. And he did do work outside of the wrestling ring, in the church, in the community, trying to rally people, trying to unionize people. But that gets overblown a little bit with, with what he did in wrestling because for a lot of guys that you talk to, including African Americans that worked with him and alongside of him and have stories about him, a lot of times Bolt could be out for self. And when opportunities presented themselves, you know, for him to get out of a situation where you could maybe form a second thing and then go back to Ole, you know, hey, I'm not one to judge a man at all. Because, again, he is a incredibly complex figure. The type of bio that Ole Anderson should have received, hopefully, you know, Thunderbolt Patterson one day has that type of biography because it's got to be long. It's got to be detailed. He went to a lot of different places and he had to experience a whole hell of a lot, but just like every human being, very complex. This book is a good one. If you could find it anywhere, grab it. Chokehold by Jim Wilson. A lot about Thunderbolt Patterson in there. And then the Tim Hornbaker book about the National Wrestling Alliance is an easier grab for you. But that's another one, too, if you want to kind of look into some things on Thunderbolt Patterson, because I'm going to be doing that now that he's in the wrestling or in the WWE Hall of Fame. I'm going to be doing some more research and going back to him. And I'm doing look, I'm, he's crossing paths right now with Ole Anderson, because you mentioned that tag team title reign he had with Jerry Briscoe. You know, he, I, think, I think it was the Andersons that they won and lost those belts to. And those are two guys, Ole Anderson and Thunderbolt Patterson, and you can throw Jerry Briscoe in that mix that had, for years after that, a decade plus after that, had interactions that changed the wrestling business. Raw ratings from Monday night, 1.75 million viewers, 0. 0.56 in 18 to 49. Right up there with the young and the restless. The uh, first hour, 1.7. Young and the Restless? <laughs> well, I forget what soap opera it was. <laughs> Granny was doing her soap opera report last night. Yeah. And uh, What is Victor doing? Oh, man. Like, somebody got put in prison and they escaped by burning down the prison. And, like, she's telling all these stories. And I, I don't know why, but I was like, I got to see how this show does, like, in the ratings. And, uh, and I went and looked it up. And, like, there's a lot of people to watch these soaps, dude. And it's not all old people. Like mm -hmm. they're they're eighteen to forty nine, 
was was up there with Raw and SmackDown and just like crushed all the other wrestling shows. Right. And the viewership beat Raw and SmackDown. I mean, oh. like three million viewers every day for this show. It was like old wrestling generations pass go and pass that along, sitting there watching you know, Y and R. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. What? Nothing. Just thought about a new segment we could introduce on the show. Wrestler what? rebuttal? <laughs> What's in Buddy's trunks? <laughs> that was what was in his bag that I put in my trunks. <laughs> which I think was, was pills. <laughs> Tic This was all his idea, by the way. That's, well. I just did what I was told. Hey. Did it for the business. Did you see, by the way, the portrait? Have you seen the new family portrait with Christian and his new family? Oh, God, no. Oh, my God. It better be in Shauna's house soon. I tell you what, I believe upset. it may be available for resale. Maybe one somebody can get one for you. Doing a velvet over thing with a, a little eternal light attached to it like it was Elvis in the 70s. Well, anyway, Rod did 1.75 million viewers in a point five six. <laughs> 1.78 first hour, 1.85 second hour, and a 1.63 in the third hour. So the people stuck around for that gauntlet match. And uh, that's the numbers there. Now, people are talking about Dave tying himself in knots to say SmackDown. Listen, sometimes sometimes there's caveats and that sort of thing. But uh, but SmackDown 
I mean, all of television a couple of weeks ago. So take out the daytime. That, that He beat everything daytime, everything nighttime, everything Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Everything. Not news. Yes. Everything. No, news too. Everything. Ooh. Everything. Yes. Damn. That did That's happen one time. Mm-hmm. Because, and you know what was funny? You know why? The, week, the Rock. Well, the week that they did it, too, I think they were actually down technically from the week before, not by a whole lot of people, by like tens of thousands or whatever, but they were actually down the week that they became the number one show, which had never happened in the history of TV going back to, what, 1947 or whatever. All right, well, I want to mention the uh, NXT main event segment last night. Which was the return of Trick Williams. You know, this show is is uh man, I I don't know if I've ever seen a show that has so many wild ups and downs. It's it's incredible. Like we had we had OTM versus Cruz Del Toro and Joaquin Wild in a tag match. Like that was a super fun match. Del Toro and, and Joaquin are great. OTM, you know, they did a good job. This freaking Bronco Nima is just He's a stud, isn't he? You, you guys will want to talk about how Triple H sucks or whatever. I'll give you the, the easy one here. If Triple H screws up Bronco Nima, he <laughs> sucks, okay? This guy is unscrew upable. He is a guaranteed home run future main eventer unless there's an in, impossible level of incompetence. He's He's big. He's tall. He looks great. He cuts yeah. good promos. He's 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 working good for his level. He did a spot, okay? You guys seen the spot? Brian Cage does it. Where one guy's on the apron and the big guy climbs up to the middle rope and he suplexes the guy in from the apron into a superplex into the ring. You've all seen that spot? Brian Cage does it? Yes. This freaking dude did it with one arm. <laughs> <laughs> One arm. One. He, like, grabbed him. He starts to lift him. He takes an arm out. He's just holding him like this, and then he does the Steve Austin. I was like, dude, this guy is awesome. So that was great. And then we had, uh, you know, the usual, like, a bunch of horribly acted segments, which we'll get to. (laughs) With music in the background. But you know what? Hey, this Roxanne, why is she not on the main roster? She did a promo, and you know what? This promo that she did was it's the fans' fault promo. How many times have we heard that? Uh, too many. How in God's name did she cut such a great promo? She cut a great promo. Great promo. She's a natural pro wrestler, period. You know period. what she is, though? She's a natural baby face, and this Absolutely. was a heel promo, and yes. she pulled it off great. And you know, Brian, we talked about it. If there's a silver lining and what they've been doing with her is – the fact that she's never worked heel well it's getting really apparent that she can work heel and her doing more dirty things in the ring i have no issue with this is a woman that needs to be on the main roster at some point this summer i mean she really should be then we had like bro the cw is gonna love this show oh the most absolutely ridiculous segment that i'll recap in full tomorrow for the brain of any show (laughs) but long story short Tony Dina's family are eating at a restaurant. Elias shows up with his belt over his shoulder. Tony has him abducted, thrown into the trunk of the car. They drive to the bridge where Tony's going to kill him. Which, by the way, you know, Tony admits killed a lot of people here on this bridge. He didn't say that exact, he didn't say kill, but he was like, taking a lot of people to this bridge. And I was the only one that walked off. So he's starting to kill the guy. But then he says, you know, this isn't about this isn't about this bridge. This is about that belt. And so he lets him walk off the bridge. It was so with the music ridiculous. Playing, but the, you're underselling the fact that Ilya Dragunov is now Liam Neeson. And I've never seen any of these movies, but I've seen the memes and the commercials and things like that. Because the way that Ilya turns around, the way this thing is shot. It, it is we're making we're making movies and in, in sitcoms major motion pictures and sitcoms here's my question about Elia that i i don't know why i just noticed this now he has got the stiffest 
You notice every time he walks, that arm is cocked that way. Did a match happen with Walter years ago where he just blew out his elbow or his arm or something? He's he's always walking like this. You'll you'll see it from here on in. I, I guarantee know. it. I don't know. Lexus King, Robert Stone. Like I like these guys, but the storyline it just sucks. Terrible. I mean, poor Robert Stone gets beaten up and. Von Wagner carries him to the back, and the fans respond by chanting, He's a baby. I'm like, yeah, they're invested in this one. We had Obafemi and Brooks Jensen, mm. where Obafemi gave this virgin such a vicious beating that I expected to wake up this morning and hear that Brooks Jensen had been cut. And he hasn't been. But, like, that's how badly he beat this dude. Then we had Ariana and Gigi. If Ariana wins, she gets to give Gigi a makeover, teach her how to be a lady. This was originally scheduled to be an angle with Tiffany and Fallon, but then Tiffany got called up to the main roster. So Ariana and Gigi are getting it. This match was absolutely atrocious. Absolutely, (laughs) positively atrocious. But hopefully they will have good vignettes. You are so mean. No, I'm I not, dude. I loved this match. I loved no, it. No, it was loved atrocious. It. Let me tell you why I loved it. Because it's a double low blow finish with yes. two women. Did you who see sold it look? bigger than ninety percent of luchadors? Exactly, and that's why. Because here's the thing with Fallon Henley and Tiffany Stratton doing the storyline that you know they ended up not doing, which was Tiffany out on the farm with Fallon. That they're such to me. It would have worked because they're far more along and because of what their characters were. This could actually be really funny, again, as a just as something as part of the two hours. It is the best use of Ariana Grace, by far the best use. And Gigi Dolan, who is fine, she's again, I think, she, I don't know if she'll ever be on the main roster or not, but she can be great in NXT for a long time. She is perfect to do this with i'm sorry i think again it is the comic the comic relief is going to be on the show anyway i'll take this we had keon and izzy dame versus thea hale and fallon henley and uh this is one of the things where if you're actually a viewer of nxt and you actually watch the show every week you watch a match like this and you realize they're all getting a lot better like this match this was a fine match this would have been fine on the main roster they're all learning how to do matches now, the stuff afterwards, like, can somebody alert everybody that Kevin Dunn is gone? Thea has to cut a promo on JC and old Jasmine Nix. And literally, she stands in the middle of the ring facing the hard cam, talking to people who are behind her. I was just tearing at my and eyes. there's nobody on that side. Are they? Do they have cue cards up? I don't I know. I mean, what is that? So we had uh, Sean Spears and Ridge Holland... Which, uh, I don't know, man. No one cared. They're not into this storyline either. But then, after all that, they hit old Trick Williams music, Mm. and this freaking place went nuts. And this guy came down to the ring, and he's so over, and he's got so much charisma, and he cut this great promo about being betrayed by Carmelo Hayes. And I'm just like, man... They, they, the reason they're not doing a title match, I, I'm starting to think, is he's going up the day after Mania. Will you stop? No. Hey, listen. Yell at me after the day after Mania. Oh, but, like, I think they're gonna. But he's cutting this promo, and then out comes, of all people, metaphor. Noam Dar, Oro Mensa, Lash Legend, and Miss Jackson. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? So Noam Dar gets in the ring... And he says, you know, we're a lot alike. You lost your best friend. I lost the cup. But the difference is I didn't go home and cry about it. I'm on to bigger and better things. And Trick's trying to tell him, dude, this ain't the time. Just get out of here. I don't want to deal with it right now. So Noam says, I'm, I'm, I'll am i just cut to the chase. I'm here to steal your hype because nobody is hotter than you right now. And Trick Williams looks over at Lash Legend and he goes, I'm looking at Lash. And it looks like she agrees. And Lash acts like, don't even start that trick. You listen to Noam. So Noam gets in the ring. They're going to have a match next week. This big brawl breaks out. And Trick's laying out Oro Mensa. And he's laying out Noam Dar. And all of a sudden, he turns around. And Lash goes for the big slap. And he catches the hand. And so, dude, this is a spot 
It's 120 years old or whatever. Heel, female, tries to do something to the male. The male grabs her and kisses her. We've seen it a million times. Well, it's now 2024. You can't be doing an angle where you grab the woman and you kiss her against her will. So it was very clever what they did. She goes to slap him. He grabs the hand and he dips her. And she looks up into his eyes. And she grabs him and kisses him. This freaking place. I thought the walls were going to melt. <laughs> they went nuts for this spot. And then Trick clears the ring and Lash ends up outside. And these people are just going haywire for this segment. And uh, I was like, and for those of you that don't know, Trick and Lash have been a couple for a long, long time. So it looks like they're going to turn that into a storyline here. But uh, somebody on my on my uh, ex goes, you know, whatever you want to say about NXT, they actually do a really good job with these romance storylines. And when you think about it, they do. Probably better than any other company. So, uh, yeah, that last segment was like, it was so hot. That segment was so hot. And tr- it, was, it was over. I was like, why isn't this for the title? Oh, stop it! These stop fans want to see him as the <laughs> no, champion. God! They, do. they can wait! Brother, don't, don't we're worry. watching a championship match built oh, off a bro. guy not throwing another guy off a bridge. Oh, come on. Stop! Will you stop? Look, what people want to see is violence. They want to see Trick get their revenge on Carmelo. The title can wait. He'll get that title. There is no concern over that. Unless he goes to the main roster the day after Mania, in that case, fine. But let me tell you something. As long as he gets his revenge on Melo, as long as they have a great gimmick set up for what that match is going to be, that's all people care about. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. I think it's my sobriety that keeps me going. Um, since I got clean and sober 15 years ago, it's it has put this kind of new shine on my life that I need to kick it into gear and continue growing and continue what I love to do, which is this wonderful business we're in and have some fun. And it's all about having fun. If you can't have fun at your job, then you don't really need to be in it. And I'm very good at what I do, so I love this business. And I just, uh, each time I go out there, it is an opportunity for me to be kind of a teacher for the youngins in the back because I'm very old school with a little new school attitude. So without the old, without the old school, there is no new school, right? So it's like all these people do the, all these impressive things all the time. And then what I like to do is completely different than that. And that's to tell a story. It's very important to me because the fans kind of, they have made us, right? So without the fans, we're nothing. And the, the fans that are uh, going through their day and they might be having a, a terrible day or whatever, and they turn on the TV on AEW just to watch us, it is my job to take them out of that day and entertain them but make them feel something. That's the most important thing is to move somebody and to make them feel something. Because if you make them feel something, they're going to come back. And so that's, that's kind of my my goal every time that I, you know, go out there, it's, um, yeah, I get a lot, ner- I get a lot more nervous at my age for some reason, which is really weird. Um, and I think they're good nerves, but, and I've always been nervous, but really since I've turned 50, it's, it's like every time I go out there, I'm just like, Oh my God, man, I can't mess up. I can't mess up because you know, there's people out there. They're going to be like, Oh, Dustin needs to retire. And I hate that. I don't want that. I want to kill it each time. I want to put on a banger and uh, tell a good psychological story for the fans to enjoy. I don't think I really need to prove myself anymore, but I think it's just an internal thing that I need to prove to myself, hey, I can still go out there and do this, right? But as far as proving to anybody else, I I believe people know how good I am and and that I can go out there and wrestle circles around some of the young ones even still today. And um, we have some incredible talent, and I'm just trying to keep up. I'm just trying to keep, in a word, young, right? And it's very difficult when you're 54, almost 55. But just to throw in a a couple of new things by evolving your characters and changing things up every once in a while, I'm good at that, and that gives me a little more life and gives me a little longer 
to kind of enjoy it right before I need to switch it up again. And I think that's the key to my career is evolving. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. As noted, tonight is AEW Big Business. And uh, and Lance is watching the show tonight. So our normal Wednesday afternoon show will not be taking place today. But we will be doing the same show tomorrow. Uh, 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern on Thursday. It will be Lance and I talking big business and whatever else is on his mind. So that is exclusive to subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com or video.f4wonline.com. And Dave and I will be back tonight to talk the AW show. Whatever comes out of the show, because I just have this feeling there's more than Mercedes, but I don't know. I want to make that abundantly clear. I don't know. It just feels like there's going to be more than that. But I could be wrong. But one way or the other, we'll talk about that tonight. And uh, all of the other news as well. And don't forget, if you haven't checked it out yet, F4WOnline.com slash Vegas. If you'd like to go to our annual convention. A lot of fun things happening. It's May 24th through May 26th in Vegas. First off, it's impossible to have a bad time in Vegas. Actually, that's not true. You can. Well, but uh, you should have a good time. Dinner, Texas Day, Brazil. Meet and greet with Vinny and I. Live Brian and Vinny show. Poder, Sace with Ed. Sweet party. Annual brunch at the Wicked Spoon and more. And uh, there probably will be more. So, anyway, we're going to uh, wrap it up. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.